Hi, this is Carrie Ann Reed Brown, and this is Carry On Friends, the Caribbean American podcast. Hey, everyone, welcome to another episode of Carry On Friends, the Caribbean American podcast. I am excited today. I tell you, I've been celebrating the five years all year, and I am excited to finally have this woman on the show. Um, Felicia Hatcher, welcome to the podcast. How are you? Thank you so much, uh, Carrie Ann, for the invitation. I'm doing okay. I'm doing okay. And congrats on five years. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So why don't you tell the community of friends a little bit about who you are, what you do, and Caribbean country you represent? Sure, sure. Uh, so my family is from Jamaica, um, and I work in tech, uh, specifically around kind of tech um, ecosystem building. And so kind of creating uh, programs, spaces, uh, even policy and research research, uh, to better support building uh, inclusive innovation ecosystems in South Florida, where where I'm based, and then uh, ultimately across the United States as well. Awesome. All right. So I'm going to bring the community a little bit back. So a few years ago, I discovered a TEDx that you did in Jamaica about your failure story. And at the time, um, it wasn't, you, you had the ice cream or what was that company? The Fever, feverish pop, feverish pops. And I was like, Oh, that's a novel idea. So, <laughs> you know, bring us, just give us a little bit of that background and how that kind of got you to where you are today. Sure. Sure. So I, I ran a gourmet popsicle and, and manufacturing company with my husband, Derek, for seven years here in Miami. Uh, prior to that, I worked for the major corporation. I worked in corporate America and for some technology companies, uh, mostly on the marketing side, product launch, and then experiential marketing. So for the MBA, I worked for the Minnesota Timberwolves as a front office marketing manager for the Minnesota Lynx. Florida girl in Minnesota did not survive there long. Uh, I worked for Sony, uh, launching the Sony ebook reader as a regional marketing manager for them. Uh, had a staff of about 300 between three states, promoting a product that arguably should have been the iPad, but you know, mm -hmm. we know the iPad, no one knows anything about the Sony ebook reader, but whatever. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and then also for Nintendo launching and on the product launch and experiential marketing team for uh, the, the, uh, the Wii Fit board and then the Wii Sports Resort video game. Uh, and then I worked for Wells Fargo launching their second life video game as well. And so um, really crazy experience as far as corporate America, extremely fast paced. Most of my jobs uh, were 100% travel. So I was on the road a lot. And I came up with this idea for starting a gourmet ice cream company uh, and gourmet popsicle company after falling down, chasing after an ice cream truck in heels. Who does that? <laughs> but me. And uh, but that was my Oprah aha moment when the economy tanked in 2008. I um, lost my job. My husband lost his job, same time uh, from the same company, same campaigns we were working on, and decided to move back to my parents' house at, I think, 24, 25-ish, and just see where this crazy idea was going to go. I often tell people, like, if I could have found a job in my industry, but, like, no one was hiring, like, everyone was firing, I probably wouldn't be on this podcast with you today, Carrie Ann, because I'd probably would be doing something completely differently, but... That's how the universe works. That's how God works. And it kind of forces you sometimes uh, or puts all the pieces together for you to like really kind of stand in your truth and say, are you going to do this or not? And so that's where Feverish Pops started. And we ran the company for seven years. We manufactured gourmet popsicles. We put alcohol in popsicles. Uh, we sold them to all kind of crazy um, major corporations. So Google and PayPal, Forever 21, Trump Hotels, Capital Records, Universal Records, Avino Lotion. Like I can keep going on and on of like how all these major companies were, were our clients because we just used to do something really cool mm -hmm. and really unique for them. We did a lot of branding of the pops, anywhere from like unique flavors, um, sometimes putting their product into the flavors, hence alcohol pops, uh, to, um, you know, getting, creating flavors that match all the color, colors of Google's logo or, you know, it's just really random company that we manufactured, we private labeled, we ran a store, we shipped nationwide, all of that, that fun stuff. And uh, we sold the company to a friend of ours, Italian ice shop um, about five years ago. And before we sold it, 
we had launched a, a nonprofit called Code Fever that was kind of marriaging two worlds for us. So the one kind of the technology side to we started off just training our employees that were at our shop because we knew that they weren't going to be in pops forever. We knew that we weren't going to be in pops forever and we wanted to train them in some of the most marketable skills possible. So Code Fever, Black Tech Week. Uh, I own a co-working space in Urban Innovation Lab with my husband and another partner, Starx. All of that initially kind of came out of wanting to make our community stronger. I wanted to better support entrepreneurs and then really just wanting to build a community. But mo most importantly, like wanting to say, like, if anyone has an idea, they should know like what the steps are. They should have a community that supports them. And then they should be able to easily connect with dollars in order to make that happen. And that didn't exist when Derek and I were running Feverish. And so like our kind of next iteration outside of that, we wanted to create an environment inside of South Florida uh, at minimum to that fosters all of that and essentially kind of rids uh, Black communities of, of being innovation deserts. You know, you s even though you said a lot, I felt it in my bone because how many people have been laid off and you're faced mm -hmm. with this, you know, I learned a long time ago, uh, losing a job is trauma <laughs> because now you mm -hmm. have to think about where you're going to eat, where you're going to sleep, how you're going to take care of kids and that yeah. stress that happens from that. But then there's something where you expect that aha moment. And, and I feel like many of us could have those aha moments. If like you said, we have resources and communities to support us when we mm -hmm. feel like, you know what, maybe we can try this, but I don't know the first place to go. So yeah. let's talk a little bit about you from that layoff moment and where you felt like, where did it come from to say, you know, I, I think I can do this. And how were you supported to do this and be confident in doing that? Because I think a lot of, a lot of people getting this aha moment. So we're executing this, there's confidence and there's support. So right, talk, right. <laughs> talk, so you're working on the support area, but we still need to do that internal work on the confidence, which is part of why mm -hmm. I wanted you to be here. How do we unleash that epicness that we have in us? Yeah, you know, I would love to say I, once I got laid off, I was just like, I could do this. It, it definitely wasn't that. And I think it's really important for people to be as candid as possible about like what the actual full on process was. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, it was an idea that I could not let go of, but in the interim of that, I was still looking for employment back in my field. And it was like constantly not getting, uh, you know, sending my resume out and not getting responses was just like, I need to figure out how to make money. And so, you know, for me, it was like, I think we call it like an MVP now, right? A minimal viable product. We talk about all that, that all the time in the startup world. But it, originally it was just that, like, let me just see and kind of test this out, buy some molds off of Amazon, come up with some flavors in my parents' kitchen. And maybe I can just make a few extra bucks until like I found, I found I, like I found a job. And like, that was really where my original like intention was like, let me play with this idea a little bit. I can't let it go. So let me just kind of test it out and see if like people respond to it. Uh, but the real goal was just like to get another gig like back into the field that I, I really truly loved. Right. And so sometimes I tell people, you know, sometimes a good paying job will stand in the way of you following your dreams just as much as a bad paying job. Because like, that was me. Like I was making really, I was making really, really good money at 24 years old, 23, 24 years old. I was also like, you know, all expense paid all over the United States. Like I was living out of a suitcase. Like I was literally living a rock star's life without like knowing how to sing or play an instrument. It's just like promoting product. Mm -hmm. And so I really truly loved my industry, but like I also just could not let go of this idea. And so it was really, honestly, it was that. It was just a lot of no's kind of led me to finally saying yes to this thing that I couldn't let go of. And that was a process and it was a slow process. You know, it was, I did not have food experience. And so I had a long list of all these things that people tell you that you should have in place before you start a business. Like I didn't have formal like food education, like none or food training, no culinary training at all, except for working at McDonald's when I was 16 years old. And my husband worked at like Subway right before he went to Morehouse. And like, and that was kind of it did not have a lot of money. You know, we used the last bit of our savings and bought two carts off of Craigslist. Didn't even have enough money to get them professionally graphic wrapped. So we went to like Home Depot and bought 
spray paint and decals that were supposed to go on your wall but we were just like we're gonna cut these out and like get the letters for the logo and just literally start peddling to events and like that's how we started and we started like people responded to it timing is also really important Carrie Ann because we were all like it was because the economy was tanking like people were bartering more than they ever did before um people were like the whole DIY kind of do-it-yourself culture was sprouting up and so a spray painting a cart didn't look kind of ghetto mm-hmm. you know or like hood or rudiment like it just didn't look janky it was just like oh my god this is really cool like you guys just spray painted this and, and so like all of that timing kind of worked really well and then social media had like was just starting to sprout up and people were just starting to under- truly understand it as a business utility and so like it worked really well for us in in that sense as well and so being spending a lot of time on the west coast and seeing like food trucks start to emerge food trucks were still like a not a thing in south in miami and in south florida and so this whole like follow us on twitter in order to find like a food truck was this new thing that we essentially kind of introduced to people and so it was a lot of kind of educating people in the very beginning it was a lot of education and failing ourselves to kind of get to a point where we started getting a footing Mm. You know, I like that you said failing ourselves because we, we are afraid of failure. You know, it's like mm-hmm. we, we don't, we spend a lot of time cooking up in the lab and fantasizing how we want something to be. And if it fails, you know, some people walk away from it. So let's talk yeah. about how in like, how did you deal or adjust with some of that failure? And, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure that having your husband was kind of, there was a balance both of you may not have been in the same failure funk at the same time. One was kind of, you know, encouraging the other while the other was in a funk and, you know, it flipped sometimes. So talk to me a little bit about how you managed failing and, and rebounding from the failures. Yeah. You know, I think the, the first part is like failure is not final. You know, it's, okay. it's, you have to iterate, you cannot get to true innovation without failing and making mistakes multiple times. Like you're constantly breaking things and trying to fix it. That's how, that, like that's really kind of the definition of innovation is figuring out a new way of doing things. And the only way you get to figure out a new way of doing things is you also in the same like instance are figuring out the wrong way to do things, right? Um, and so it's, it's, it's interesting. And I have a lot of conversation. Like I, I live in two worlds, right? Like our, like from a culture standpoint, and like our community and like kind of the startup community that is all about like failing fast. And my pushback always to them is like, you know, failure is really different from a cultural standpoint. Yes. It's different. It's different from a race standpoint. It's different from a cultural, it's different from an ethnicity standpoint. And so failure means different things, you know, and, and for our communities, it, it is this final thing because oftentimes you are the one, right? You are the one that got a chance to have this opportunity you are the one that got a chance to go to college and so because we ingrain our our communities and constantly saying like you are not allowed to fail that's why we're not oftentimes seeing the 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 massive innovation happen is because oftentimes we we pick very safe careers Mm -hmm. you know we have certain careers that are known in our community Mm -hmm. and respected and everything else is not. Mm -hmm. And so being able to kind of shift the narrative about like what is possible and even just like what success and actually and failure looks like, because those two things are, should be individualized and they're not. And so failure to you, Carrie Ann, should mean something completely different than it does mean to me. And success to you should mean something completely different than it does to, to, to me because those are individual experiences and what you want and what I want and what everyone else wants is all different. I think ultimately there are certain things you want basic Maslow's needs to be met. Yes. You know, you want security, you want safety, you want uh, to be taken care of, you want financial stability, but how you get there and how that aligns with you working in your zone of genius are two completely different things. And so I think starting from there is, is really important, but then also changing the conversation you know, of like one being able to be at a place where you can be curious about the things that you want and curious about the things that you ultimately get to explore until you figure out like exactly what your lane is and the gifts that you ultimately want to leave on this earth and the work that you ultimately want to do um, is, is, is definitely one thing. But I think this kind of 
image of what we think, you know, the white picket fence and the 2.5 kids and the dog, like yeah. that was bust wide open yeah. in the, when the economic downturn happened because everyone was told you just go to college and there'll be a job waiting for you. And that job will afford you this kind of lifestyle. And I think over the past, um, what was that, 12 years yeah, since the, the major economic yeah. downturn, mm -hmm. people have looked at things a lot differently as a result of that. And I, so I, I think there are positive strides in that, but like failure is not final, yeah. you know? And, and I think because of technology, you get to kind of try things out. You get to test things out where you don't have to put like, you don't have to necessarily bet the house in order to figure out if this thing is the right thing or not. And you can get to figuring that out and testing things out much faster so that you can pivot, you know? Mm -hmm. And so like, I always tell people like, Hey, if you want to start a university, I can't tell you, you can do that on a ramen noodle budget. Right. But like, and that may take a long time, but what you can do is you can start teaching a course based off of like packaging up your knowledge that you have. And you can teach a course on lynda.com or you can teach a course on Teachable or Kajabi and like all these platforms and be able to test and iterate and see if your idea makes sense before you then decide to bet the house and kind of double down in this area that you aren't necessarily sure on. Like there's these tools that allow us to kind of hedge our bets so the failures aren't as large. But again, like, like I said before in the beginning, like failure is not final. And I think that's the biggest thing that we have to wrap our head around about like that process and, and how we approach it. Yeah. You know, you know, a few episodes ago, I talked about, you know, how success is a long game. And even though I have mm -hmm. this vision of what it would look like, you know, even that vision of the success is going to show up differently, you know, so I might right. imagine that, oh, it's going to work out that way, but it may not. And I still have to look at it and say, okay, it may not work out exactly the way I wanted to, but where what are the gains in this? Because there's a gain in most things. Even if it's a failure, you've gained knowledge, like you said, that, oh, this does not work. I will not try that again. So mm -hmm. it's, um, it's reconciling, like you said, um, from a, a cultural standpoint. Um, I remember we went to Haiti Tech Summit, and I remember Dr. Clara Nelson says, culturally, you know, um, non-people of color are told that they could, you know, fail and fail fast. You know, Caribbean mm -hmm. people are like, mommy, I get 90%. Where's the 10% type conversation. Yeah. So it's almost like we always have to be at 100%. And if we are not 100% sure, we stay very safe. And that balance come, can, can happen with what you're kind of doing, which is creating a community because or parents are choosing safe or recommending safe careers because that's what they see that mm -hmm. is repeatable and they're like oh yeah over and over again a doctor will make money a lawyer will make money but unless they're they could see examples of other people thriving in some unknown career what they can't figure it out that's because we need that support from family and in and if they can't see how something's going to work we'll have a hard time from explaining to the parents like what you do and the constant pressure like why you never go and do this why yeah, you go on to yeah. that? So, you know, I love that you brought that up, but that still shouldn't stop us from, like you said, you know, while you have the job, just try a little thing on the side and keep trying it and seeing if it's, if it works. So let's segue a little bit to how do I, failure is not equitable across culture or households. It's not the same. Success is not the same. How, mm -hmm. how do, how do we, go internal and find that thing that's epic about us to un and unleash that into this world and, you know, make sure that we leave this earth giving our best and knowing that we've yeah. given our full potential as to what God has given us. Yeah. So there's a, there's a really good book that I, I, I absolutely have been enamored with since I, I read it and I was introduced to it in this mastermind group that I was a part of, and it's called The Big Leap uh, by an author, the the author's name is Gay Hendricks. And so in The Big Leap, he talks about getting to ultimately like what your zone of genius is. Um, and then like the struggle that people often have just even kind of getting to that point in, within their lifetime. And so inside the zone of, uh, inside The Big Leap, there's four quadrants to that. And it's an exercise that people essentially kind of need to do in order to understand truly what they should be doing and kind of what their gifts are and like how to like live and play in that. 
And so like the first zone of, of it is like the zone of incompetence. And like the zone of incompetence is like all these, all the things that you do that you have no business doing. Like you, you ultimately, and more than likely, you actually probably suck at these things, Mm -hmm. but you do it anyways. Why? No reason, but you do it, Mm -hmm. but you suck at this. Mm -hmm. And so I think our educational system is to blame for us constantly feeling that we need to work on and perfect the things that we suck at. at. No, you suck at it. Mm -hmm. You suck at it. Like be honest with yourself. You're not good at this thing Mm -hmm. and just be okay with that and move on but double down and on the things that you ultimately are good at. That's where you should be spending most of your time. And you find people that are really, truly good at those things to fill in in the inadequacies, inadequacies that you have, right? Mm-hmm. And so the zone of, and there's a zone of incompetence, but then there's a zone of competence. Like, you know how to do these things. Should you be doing them? Are they the best use of your time? No, but you do have a competence in doing these things, right? Um, my zone of inco- my zone of competence is writing. Like I I can write. I've I have won scholarships with writing. I have written five books. But if I ever had to be a journalist or had to be tied to a deadline, do not come looking for Felicia. I have failed you on that. I literally can only write when I am like angry or like wildly passionate about something. Otherwise, it's not getting done. And so like I run a blog and it's not consistent, but when I write, it's epic, yeah. but don't ever hold, you know what I mean? And so that's my zone of confidence. Like I know how to write, but it's nowhere near what's going to make me my millions and billions. And it is not the thing that wildly excites me. And so from your zone of incompetence, you have your zone of confidence, then you have your zone of excellence. And your zone of excellence is you are actually really good at this thing uh, or the series of things. And you know how to do it. People often come to you and, and ask you to do that thing. And you probably make really or pretty good or decent money like doing it. You probably make really good money doing it, actually. But there is this itch that you have as like a human being that's just saying, this isn't it. You know, like I like it, but I don't, I don't love it. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't ultimately bring me joy. And if I were to leave this earth today, I would still feel like I, have, I did not play full out with all the gifts that I was given. And that takes you to your zone of, zone of genius. Your zone of genius is saying, I am the best in the world at this thing. And saying that unapologetically, and, by, and most people can't ever own saying that, which is a problem within itself. It kind of starts skirting on like imposter syndrome. Sure. Yes. Because you have the receipts, you have the experience, you are brilliant in this area. You can definitively say as a person, I am the best at the world at doing this. And when people call upon me, I always do my best work in this area. And it's that cliche thing that people say where you like work, you can be working for hours and not even feel like you're working at all. Yeah. And I always push back like, no, you are actually yeah, working. working. It is hard it work, is work, right? Yes. Uh, but it, it ultimately like you get lost in this type of work. That is your, those are your gifts. That is your zone of genius. And that is where you should be living and playing. And unfortunately, People like spend their time on this earth and they pass and they don't ultimately ever jump from their zone of excellence to their zone of genius. But that's where you make your money. That's where you, 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 that's where you make it. And that's where you ultimately like have truly have like your legacy work is that. And then sometimes people list a few different things. Like when you kind of do a quadrant with yourself and like write all those things, sometimes you, you have a list of, or if there are a few things that are in that box and you really ultimately like look for what is the alignment um, or what is the commonality between all of those things. And so from that, like I kind of create like, then there's like your zone of opportunity based off of like what you've learned within the four quadrants that Gay Hendricks put together. And my thing is like looking at the alignment of all those things in your zone of genius and then figuring out, are these things that are always going to be hobbies for me or is the opportunity to monetize this thing and then being able to make a decision on moving forward that way? Yeah. I love that you said that a few weeks ago, I was at a workshop at church and the, the pastor was doing the session and he was like, you know, don't operate at your floor, operate at your ceiling. Like, you know, he said, you know, delegate your floor and and that's where your competencies are. You're, you, you could do it. You're doing a good job at it, but delegate it to someone else so you can operate at your higher level and because as you operate more at your higher level, there's this, there's this thing of abundance. As you work yeah. at that higher level, you keep producing higher results and you keep 
um, developing other skills that are complementary to your where you operate at your ceiling. And so when, 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 when he said that, it was just like, yes, I get it. And so I love to delegate. My, my sister-in-law uh-huh. keeps saying, you know what? Carrie's the best delegator. <laughs> I, I, I send everybody out. Well, most Caribbean people, they delegate. Parents delegate because they're sending you everywhere. They are never getting up to do anything. So I picked that up. So I love that you've brought that into or awareness and this imposter syndromes and this false sense of humility that sometimes we take on, whereas, you know, own the fact that, yes, I do this very well and Mm -hmm. I'm owning that and, and not, not, you know, saying, oh, please, this was not even my best work, blah, blah, blah. No, it was your best work. Yes, it was a good day. Just, just accept it. And the other thing that I've learned over time is someone says, hey, Carrie, I like your, I like when you do this. I don't necessarily have to reply with a compliment. I should just kind of stand in the compliment they give me because that's an, another sign that we're not comfortable receiving right. the accolades that someone has truly seen in us, right? So if they're like, Carrie, you did a good job on that. I'm like, yeah, I like when you did that too. And they're probably looking at me like, I didn't ask you. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know my my angelo says don't pick it up and don't put it down yeah yeah when like when you receive like compliments and accolades because she's just it was a it's a very awesome um interview if you i don't know if you saw it but like it was it's iconoclast when maya angelo interviews dave Chappelle. like they're interviewing each other and and she says this thing like don't pick it up and don't put it down and so she's like when you pick it up when you get the compliments, right? When you're amazing, you're awesome, blah, blah, blah. You also have to pick it up when they say like, you're a nobody and you're a failure and you're a disgrace. So she's just like, just when someone compliments, you just say, you, she's like, you just say, ah, or just say, I received that. Yes. And because oftentimes I think again, like when, and I speak a lot on imposter syndrome because I personally dealt with it. I still deal with it. I, mean, I don't think it different ever goes Different levels away. of it. It's just different There's different levels, levels of it. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and you, you get, you get, what you do is you get better at recognize when it's kind of creeping in so that you can kind of squash that and it doesn't debilitate, debilitate you and stop you from doing your work. It, but I think so. Uh No, I I was about to say, you know, what I've been doing, I've been praying to, you know, and and I've been praying a prayer to have the right people around me. And I I kid you not, whenever I am going through my imposter syndrome moment, there's this one woman that always sends me an email out the blue and is like, she checks me. And I always say, God, thank Uh you for sending her. Because it's almost (laughs) like every time I'm in a place of doubt, she comes in and she's just, and, and I mean, that's not sustainable. But in the moment you need them, because you could you could check yourself, but there's always someone the moment you need that like reinforcement to say, yeah, keep doing right. that, that person shows up. And, and that's just an amazing thing to have. But that I feel that comes once you get to an awareness that, you know what, imposter syndrome is, is, is my procrastination tool here. And mm-hmm. whenever I don't execute on something, the, the, procra- the imposter syndrome is what I'm using as a procrastination tool. So I don't yeah. move forward. I, I call, so I call those people like, you're, are you kidding me, friends? Right? Like, <laughs> you, you, don't, you don't have a lot of them in your life. You know, if you're blessed, you have like one or two. But they're, they're the ones that they allow you to vent because life is real, right? And if you're doing anything of meeting, of meaning like life is going to punch you in the gut more t- more times than you can ever like imagine right and that is one it's a human experience too it's just a big big test but like those people that allow you to vent and then just remind you like who you are what you've accomplished that you should not be thinking less of yourself that you need to go back tomorrow and like show them who you are like those those are gifts mm-hmm. and you don't get a lot of people like that but they play such an important role in us like understanding when imposter syndrome is creeping in and then just reminding ourselves to value like who we are and what we're accomplished because everything around us, you know, the products that people sell like, are always going to talk about how inadequate you are. It's a sales tactic. But when you are constantly bombarded with those messages every single day, it's almost impossible to not internalize those things. And so oftentimes it happens a lot with like high performing women, but don't be mistaken, it happens with men as well. It just the way that it manifests themselves is differently. Like a lot of times men will mask like their low confidence or just kind of uncomfortable with situations with bravado. 
you'll see that a lot of times mm-hmm, right mm-hmm. um but oftentimes like it's just like it's you're just constantly kind of questioning yourself but my whole thing with people and it's just like you have the receipts <laughs> and what are receipts receipts are proof of purchase mm-hmm. of like the degrees you have the experience that you have every no that led to yes the all the resiliency all the know-how your expertise your, your genius like that is what uh, at minimum people are just wanting you to show up because what's happening is like you are asking the universe or whoever you pray to to like shine on you opportunities but then you get into rooms and then you shrink mm-hmm. and so you feel like you're being missed on opportunities and people aren't valuing you but the times that you're supposed to show them who you are and the value that you can bring, you shrink because you're so much in your head. Mm -hmm. Like imposter syndrome is all in your head. And so like outside validation actually becomes really important whether people think that or not. And people argue with me that all the time. But I'm like, if you were so stuck into your head that you were not showing up and you're not taking up as much space as you post to in the world, you need outside validation to remind you who you are and that you do need to show up. And then you need tools that allow you to show up and do your best work because you're doing it already. But the whole other side of that, that comes a part of the world truly benefiting from who you are and your badassness are the things that you're not doing and the ways that you shrink in the rooms that you walk into every day. Mm -hmm. So um, what is a tool? So I spoke about the person who, you know, affirms and the, are you kidding me friends and friends that I have show up? What, what is a tool that someone can use to help them because like I said you you know the friends won't always show up when you need them so you need to have your own resources to help you through those moments you're shrinking yeah so it's it's definitely are you kidding me friends right having them on speed speed dial having them save into your favorites is one um putting together a list of I call it like your do epic ish list Mm -hmm. um and it's literally, you write down a list of everything that you have ever accomplished. And you keep that somewhere that when you are having those dark moments, when you are questioning who you are, when you are questioning even if you deserve to be in those rooms, like you can pull it out. Often just time, just put it as a note on your phone so that it's always accessible because we take our phones with us and be able to look at that. Because it's like, it's in these moments when, when there's pressure around us or people over talk us or we miss the opportunity to share an idea that we know that we should, that you just can be able to easily like reference that like, oh yeah, I've accomplished this and I achieved this and I've had this result. Even if you go back to like when you played like youth sports and you got like the participation trophy, like whatever you need to put on that list, definitely put on, put on the list because those things really, really help you. I think. Uh-huh. No, 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 go ahead. I, I was going to say they uh, really I, do. Yeah. And, and it's, it's such a simple thing, right? People oftentimes want overcomplicated ways of, of solving problems. Like, no, you just need a reminder mm-hmm. because you, you do know who you are, right? We get home, like we dance in the, you know, you dance like, but then you get on the dance floor and you don't dance at all. Right. You just kind of become a wallflower and you watch. And so there are those moments, moments when we spark and shine, but in the times that it matters against the goals that you were setting, those are the times that you have to do that, that most. And then, like you said, you know, if it's not your, are you kidding me, friends, surround yourself with your tribe, Mm -hmm. with people who understand who you are, that are doing the similar kind of work, um, that are going to wholeheartedly celebrate you and not hate on you. These aren't necessarily the same as like your, are you kidding me, friends? But this is just a, a, like a wild, like a, a, a mad tribe that like wholeheartedly supports and moves you forward, but also allows you to be able to have really candid conversations. And then I think like the, the last part of that is in staying in your lane, mm-hmm. right? Because I think oftentimes imposter syndrome sometimes seeps in when we're doing things that we have no business doing, yeah. right? Kind of going back to in zone of incompetence and zone mm-hmm. of confidence. You know, sometimes those feelings that we have about being inadequate is because instead of putting someone else on for the opportunity, we were being greedy and we decided to do it. Mm-hmm. And so the feeling of inadequacy inadequacies are right because that's not what you should be doing Mm -hmm. and so staying on your lane and being able to put on other people so that they can share in like the wealth and sharing the opportunity is also something that allows you to stop being and kind of sitting and dealing and grappling with imposter syndrome as well and then just remember that you're not like stop giving all the credit to luck you know luck plays such a small role in comparison to when you are ripe and ready for opportunities and I think I see too many people um, kind of give things up to luck um, and, and not saying like, this is truly the reason, like I worked my butt off for this. 
Like I truly deserve that. And then toot your own horn. Like it's, it's you know, <laughs> people don't like, yes. we do not toot our own horn. There have been times where like I work with entrepreneurs all the time as the nature of the work that I do. And I remember having like kind of going around this room and having everyone kind of introduce themselves. And I'll never forget this lady. And I was like, I was like, I, I make people do this exercise called the power because, and it's like, you introduce yourself, hi, my name is, you say, I'm an epic expert in whatever this one thing is. And then you, you uh, follow that up with a because statement. And because is like all your receipts. This is not your time to be humble. This is your time to re- let people know why you are an epic expert. And if you do the because part right, no one will ever question your expert statement because you have let them know, like, I got this degree from this school. I produced this results for this company that I work for. I produced this result. I was featured in this publication. I was awarded this thing. Who's going to question that? Mm-hmm. But what happens is like, you know, one of the ladies, she was just like, yeah, I went to school in Boston and, you know, I work for this company, didn't say the company name. I'm like, what's the co- price Waterhouse Cooper? Okay. That's a big deal. Yeah, right? That's a huge deal. <laughs> like, Right. And what school did you go to in Boston? Harvard. Harvard. Like, why why would you F? just say Boston? <laughs> like, you know, like you paid that money to say Harvard name. Like, right. Go out. <laughs> you, right. And so like, come on, you know what I mean? Like, why not say it? it's not, it's, it's not like, it's, you're not being arrogant. You are, you do, you've done those things. Well, where people begin to question people is like when people own up to or take ownership in things that they actually did not actually do. Well, here's the other thing that I've discovered, right? So I found that I was doing something similar and it was just me journaling. I love to journal and I write through, I'm always reflective and introspective. And I find that, you know, in maybe five out of 10, six out of 10 cases, the reason why some people downplay those things is because when, when I naturally show up as who I am, someone says, oh, she's a show off or she's a this. And it, it happens at a very critical time when you're forming social relationships. And so mm-hmm. you learn to, if I show up and do what is excellent, this, th- this is just what I do naturally. I'm not even making an effort. It's just what I, this is, this is me showing up every day doing this. It, it comes off you, you, this feeling of rejection and not being part of a community because mm-hmm. some, she, why is she always showing off? She called Harvard or why is she always, you know, so you, you have those feelings and, and when you, and, and what happens is sometimes when you are genuinely, genuinely around people who want to celebrate that, it's very hard to reconcile if Felicia really genuinely supports me or she, you know, she's like those other people who weren't really happy for me. And even though I wasn't doing anything yeah. extra, they just were mad because I was smart enough to go to Harvard. You know what I mean? And so a lot of times yeah, but- those internal work, we have to, I mean, we can't pay attention to it, but I, as long as you identify that this is where you're operating from, I guess those, you you kidding me, friends and the 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 tribe they kind of help you work through those moments but i remember when i discovered that just by showing up as who i was was a problem for some people and then you start right. dimming your light because other people just didn't like the way you shine that, and other people's problem other people's um concerns and thoughts about <laughs> you are no, never your concern it, yes never right and 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 that's just it and so oftentimes when we talk about the ego we mostly talk about it being like this arrogant thing that we're projecting, yeah. right? And, but we never talk about like the internal ego of thinking that people are thinking negative things or talking about us. And oftentimes that's just not true. Like we make up these stories in our head all the time. Like if I say this, they're probably thinking this. And as a result of what I think that they're probably thinking that they may more than likely are not thinking I am not going to show up as my whole self. Mm -hmm. And so you missed the opportunity. It's not those other people. And if they have a problem with you, so what? Their problem is actually not you, it's themselves. And so you're going to deny yourself opportunities that have your name on it because of people that did not work as hard as you have a mental thought process about how you should live your life. That's insane. And I'm saying it's insane because I I dealt with that, right? Like, oh man, like I'm not going to do this because I do that. Or I'm not going to read my full bio because, but I worked my ass off for that full bio. Mm -hmm. And so if you think I'm bragging, that's fine. 
That's your thought. But what I'm not going to do is miss an opportunity that has my name on it because the person that needed to know everything that I've done did not know it because I chose to play small because someone else that was not going to say no, yes or no to this opportunity thought something of me. Yeah. Like we have to stop that in 2020. Mm -hmm. Like that is, (laughs) it's just, it's not okay, but we have been trained to think that. Mm -hmm. And so what ends up happening is mediocre Bob gets the opportunity that has our name on it because mediocre Bob didn't do anything. But the the little things that mediocre Bob did, he is shouting from the rooftop. Meanwhile, the person that has 10 times the qualifications, the experience, the know-how, the credentials, the receipts as mediocre Bob is being passed up, is being underpaid, and is continued to be passed up and kind of living the life that they should not be living, but mediocre Bob is like out here and living it. Yeah. That's not okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wholeheartedly agree. And I, I, I remember reading about that tooting your horn, that that's something that you just have to do because it's a matter, if, if, if you have a struggle with it, you just have to do it as a matter of survival. You just said it. You're going to be yeah. underpaid when somebody else who's going to be overpaid for something that they didn't do. You are doing everything. So I, I, I just love this conversation. A lot of quotables here yeah. because, like you said, in 2020, we have to be rising to the level of our excellence. That, that was mm-hmm. in us, the gift that we were given and that we need to utilize before we, you know, we die. And that's the reality. Mm-hmm. And how do we do more of that? So tell me a little bit more. Um, I'm in New York, but, you know, I have friends mm-hmm. in South Florida and, you know, I, we have a good amount of the audience in South Florida. Tell, um, tell us a little bit about, you know, Code Fever, how people could get involved, like who is it for and all yeah. that good stuff. Great, great, great question. And so, I mean, the easiest way to, to get involved or learn more about Code Fever is, is checking out our website and it's codefevermiami.com. Um, We do work nationwide. And so uh, whether you are a young person looking to um, learn computer programming, learn basic digital literacy skills, or just how to navigate a startup ecosystem um, as someone of of, of color, like that's that's our organization. And so we've trained over 4,000 students in those three areas. We also, um, our team, our awesome team and our young people built out the Grinch video game in partnership with NBC Universal recently when the movie came out. So over uh, three, close to 3 million students and teachers have been introduced to computer programming as a result of our, our, our game that we built up on the Hour of Code website. And, and then a, the other side of that is just kind of strengthening communities and strengthening entrepreneurs to get better access to opportunities within the tech and innovation space. And so whether you're a tech startup founder, uh, we have resources. We put a conference together. We have a venture capitalist and residence program. And then we have space, you know, and so Space Call Tribe is a co-working space and urban innovation lab as a kind of like a taking up space in our neighborhoods and being able to have a space that is a magnet for innovation and resources and opportunities and dollars. That is, that's the work that, that, that we do. Um, and then I just kind of overall, just kind of changing the narrative, like who we think gets to be an innovator who we get to think, you know, works in or builds in, in the tech space is ultimately like our big goal with the, with the work that we do. So um, that's us. That's the easiest way to get involved. We do Black Tech Weekends in nine cities across the United States now. Um, and so that, that, that's, our, that's our work. That's our work. Wow. Wow. Um, that's so amazing. And I am so glad you came on to the show to talk about just unleashing the epicness that all of us must do in 2020. Yes. And <laughs> you know, thank you for it. having me. Karen. No, no, no. This was so much fun. I'm, I'm so happy. And, and looking forward to a black tech weekend. Normally you have it in February. Is that's the first one or no, not yeah, we, so we usually we usually do it in February. We're not doing it in February this year because we are changing up the conference. Ah. Uh, we're adding a, a research component to the work that we do so that there are more data-driven uh, decisions that are made about an economic development standpoint within our communities. And sense. so we're, we're doing that part first, and then we're going to reintroduce the conference in, in a different way later this year. And so um, but we're really excited about that. Um, we're just, 
it's been very disheartening about the lack of research that is done about our entrepreneurs and their mobility within the communities that they're that they're in all across the United States. Mm -hmm. And the fact that no one cares enough to get the data. Mm -hmm. that. Right. Not even just the data, because we the data is being collected, it's just being weaponized against us. Yeah. And so no one is actually using data to tell the stories on the prosperity of our our potential, our innovation potential, our our economic power. Um deeper than just saying we're a trillion dollar buying power, but like not actually being able to use that data in order to actually affect change of policy in a positive way on a local state and federal level is like the new kind of work that we're looking to do with like with Black Tech Week so that we actually start seeing change start happening in our communities. You said a word. I, I feel you on that. Um, so I, I best of luck on that research. I'd be, okay. I'd be so happy to support it because I just feel like there's not enough, and we already know that people of color, we drive culture. We, are, we, we drive trends. And because that is known, we don't get access to the information. Yeah, that. yeah. And then the right people aren't collecting it either, which is the bigger part of the problem, right? And so Because they have their own biases have people as that well. Are, they, have, they have their own biases. They have their own use for it. And then there's a lot of misinformation as well. You know, like one of the things that I fight people on all the time and we do this exercise every time we do a black tech weekend in a, in, a, in a city is we we ask people like this this notion that that the, the black dollar only circulates i think someone said like six hours within a black community i like find the re find the actual report for me online and who commissioned that report and what organization what organization what company like find the source and no one can find it, but it is the thing that we constantly say about like our communities not being worth a damn, mm -hmm. but it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And so when you, when you start seeing how often we talk about misinformation about our community or how the sheer amount of data that exists that constantly tells us that we're not worth anything, we are the highest number of this, we're the highest number of prisons, we're the highest uninsured, we're the highest health despair, like, all of this stuff and I'm just like wait so where are we winning because if we talk about black women being the fastest growing sector of new entrepreneurs and that is not being seen in other sectors there is a problem there is a big misinformation and we have to be able to fix that and solve for that and then most importantly like we have to then start putting that into our normal conversations and not constantly only believing the worst information about african-american and caribbean people like that is not okay anymore yeah. and so like my thing for anyone i think when you ask me about how people can get involved with our organization i think outside of the programmatic stuff is like just do better research about us and share better messages about us and our potential and then like the organizations and the institutions that you are part of like press upon them to do better data collection and dissemination of our communities because we deserve that if they take our dollar, they deserve to tell better stories about us. And it takes all of us collectively to be pushing upon the organizations and institutions that we are a part of, that we work for, that we partner with in order to make that happen. Absolutely. Absolutely. And on that note, social media handles where they can find you and hear yeah. you. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Felicia Hatcher on everything. So it's easy for me to remember. So Felicia Hatcher on everything. And then co-fever and i'm black tech week on everything as well awesome felicia thank you so much for being on the podcast and as i like to say at the end of every show walk good you've been listening to carry on friends a show about the caribbean american experience we post new episodes every two weeks and if you want to learn more buy merchandise or sign up for our newsletter check out our website carryonfriends.com the Carry On Friends podcast is produced by Breadfruit Media and new episodes are available every other Tuesday morning. You can listen to the podcast on the website, carryonfriends.com, or you can listen on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, or wherever you like to listen to your podcasts.